Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Impact Chat, a series bringing you real people and real conversations. My name's Cathy, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Impact is a completely volunteer-led and driven charity, making grassroots and practical differences to Victorian women and children fleeing extreme violence at home. While we may be a charity, we don't give charity. What we do is give gifts, services and hope with dignity, and we give dignity with gifts, services and hope. If you're able to, please consider giving a tax deductible donation, which we'll be directing to our free court child care program, a free service for families who need this, this while their parent is in court dealing with family matter, uh, violence related matters. I'm currently sitting on the home at home on the land of the Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. Whichever land you're on, we acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the first peoples of Australia, the traditional owners of the lands and the waters on which we're privileged to live, work and play. Lands and waters which have never been ceded. I recognise their people's continuing connection to land, waters and community, and I pay respects to their people and to their elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, I've got two very exciting things to share with you. Firstly, we have a CSA, a community service announcement that we've created and it's gone free to air. We're very lucky about that to Channel 7 and Channel 9. Perhaps you've seen it. If not, I'd like to share it with you here now. During our new norm of connecting, domestic violence has spiked. Many women are no longer alive. Others hospitalised, women and their children have been traumatised. Step up, call out the perpetrators and support the victims. We do and we need your help. Log on to Impact for Women and see how you can help victims of domestic violence. Tonight, we're really privileged to have two very, very special people here with us. Jo Stanley is our special guest and Mike Larkin is also our special guest and he'll be facilitating the conversation. Uh, jo and has been with us before, both are very well known to most people who've watched any TV at all and we're really lucky to have them. Mike, I'm going to flip it over to you to introduce Joe and to have the conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cathy, and a very good evening. Well, you may or may not know, I've been the weather presenter with Channel 10 for about 25 years. So I'll start by saying, always fine apart from the chance of a shower, remembering it's a <laughs> forecast, not a promise. So Joe and I have actually crossed paths over the years. And uh, I've got to start by saying, I didn't know a lot about impact and I've gone through some of the literature that Cathy has sent me and what a wonderful idea to step up and assist. Now, I am no expert in the field of violence, etc., but I'm a very, very strong supporter. And as you are aware, it's 100% volunteer led and driven. So I'm very, very pleased to be a part of that. Now, I've actually been retrenched from Channel 10 after 25 years, just a few weeks ago, which uh, has come as a real shock. And it may be to do with COVID, it may be to do with cost cutting, uh, but I'm effectively unemployed, which is a very, very well, it's an unusual position to be in, and um, I'm going to have a bit of a chat about that a little bit later. But what I want to do is introduce to you to radio television personality, Joe Stanley, first up. How are you tonight, Joe? I'm really well, thanks, Mike. And it's lovely to be sharing the screen with you. I don't think we've ever done this before. We've only ever seen each other at parties. That was you, was it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually seen you first thing in the morning. Uh, what, have you joined me on the Matt and Joe show back then? Exactly, on radio, yes. Yeah. So it's all, it's right. all safe and sound. <laughs> now, you're, you're the very, uh, very, very special guest speaker tonight. Now, I might start by saying, um, do you have any input with impact or is there a reason that uh, you are uh, very, very happy to talk to us tonight? Well, Mike, I am very, very passionate about gender equality and I feel really honoured whenever I get asked by any organisation that contributes to empowering women and girls and in particular contributes to uh, a safer world and a happier and a, a, a happier life and a life in which women and girls can thrive. Um, so I've, I've done a lot of work with lots of different organisations that are responding 
to family violence and assisting victim survivors of family violence. But I really love Impact for Women. I was so pleased when Kathy first approached me and we had our coffee in uh, a little cafe in Glen Huntley Road, which now we wouldn't be able to sit in, but it was a lovely time for us to sit and, and meet and to talk about the work that Impact does. And I was particularly moved, I guess, by the bags of love that they pack every year for Mother's Day and for Christmas. I understand this year they'll be packing 2,000 bags of love for Christmas, which is an extraordinary amount. But knowing the difference that that makes for uh, women who are very isolated, women who have had to leave pretty much everything that they've ever had in their lives because they were fearful for their lives, um, I just think it's an extraordinary thing that Impact for Women do. I always feel like working with organisations like Impact for Women and working on uh, any kind of advocacy for gender equality is partly gratitude. It's an expression of gratitude that I myself have been really fortunate, um, that I've always felt safe in my relationships and I've always felt supported. Uh, but it's also a way of, I suppose, um, creating a better world for my daughter Willow and for all of her friends. Um, and it's letting the women who are victim survivors of family violence know that uh, they're not invisible and that I care very much for them and I, I want to help them, I guess. It look, very well said. And the important part also, it's very much grassroots. It's helping everybody that or possibly could be overlooked or needs a bit of assistance. And also there's that wonderful uh, the court child care program, which does assist uh, babysitting, assisting to look after your children when you may have to go to court and things like that. Now, you mentioned your daughter, Willow, and I want to touch on Willow for a little while because you have spoken about her since day one, a yeah. very proud mother you are, but also, very, very importantly, you're instilling the perfect skills for a young girl to grow up to be a young professional woman. Well, I hope so. Oh. I mean, um, I am... I am aware that I talk nonstop about her and I, um, <laughs> I assume that's deeply annoying for other parents, but I can't help it. I just think she's a miracle, basically. And I, I just, um, I mean, all mothers are biased. I think that's our role. We should be biased. And so I make no apology about that. But I think it's really a privilege to be her mother. It's a privilege to see her really... Um, understand day by day who she is. I guess I grew up in a family where we weren't necessarily empowered to express who we are in the way that this generation of children are. And I think that's just the 80s, you know. It was just a different time when kids weren't really empowered to really think about who they are and, you know, follow your interests and all that sort of stuff. Whereas for me, I just, ever, since she was born, I want to be taught by her who she is and I want to empower her to really embrace and explore every part of who she is and um, do whatever it takes for her to really feel comfortable in expressing that and knowing that her, her true self is perfect as it is. You know, she, she herself is enough. And I think that's all we need for our kids to step into teenage years and adulthood for them to know that they themselves are enough. And I know your children are older but, you know, you've gone through high school with them knowing that the pressures around social media and peer group and all of that, I mean, you tell me, how do you even navigate that? Well, I'm just going to go back on you for a moment because what you've done is a wonderful thing because via media, if you like, you've talked about the good, the bad, the indifferent things about empowering your daughter Willow to be her own person and do this, don't do that. If you, haven't succeed, if you haven't failed, if you haven't tried hard enough, all the right things uh, for a young girl to go through. And I think it's important when a person in the media also can go through all well, the more challenging times as well. And then I think everybody at home can relate to that because they go, oh, it's not just me. Mm. Jo, who is, is like a star up there, she has the same concerns, the same problems. So, oh, yes. Well, let me tell you, I, just like <laughs> all mums, I can't get my kid in the bath and then I can't get her out again once she's in the bath. I'm like, you did, you've you refused to get in and now you're refusing to get out. I can't win. So, <laughs> yeah, we're all the same, Mike. I think she gets that from her mother just quietly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've got an interesting... I've had an interesting year, if you like. My daughter, uh, turning 18 next month, has been uh, experiencing year 12 at home. 
So it's been very challenging, missing out on all the good things uh, a year 12 student should be going through. Uh, hopefully they've got a school lose at the end of November down at Rye. They've hired their house, uh, a group of six of them, but uh, who knows whether we can actually get out of Melbourne at this stage. But I, I think what you try and do is bring up your children the best you can. You show them right from wrong, and then it's up to them after that. So I think you try and let them make a few mistakes, but not too many as such. Uh, and you try and nurture that child to, as you said, to be their own person. So I have a daughter oh, yeah. who's... Go on. go on, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so I've got a daughter who's turning 18, and I've got a son who's turning 17, doing year 11 at home. They both went back to school this week, which was good for our household. So my yes. and I are still together, <laughs> because all four of us were at home. So that was, that was very challenging um, and very, very interesting indeed. But um, in the last six months, she's changed her thoughts on what she wants to do in life. Uh, she, it was always about humanities and something like that, but now it's about psychology ah. and understanding people. So uh, I think, if anything, COVID has proved to be uh, something positive for her. Uh, my son, he's looking at engineering. That hasn't changed at all. Um, so so that, that's that. So, now, so, I, so can I ask you, yeah. with teenagers then, you know, sort of towards the end of their teen mm -hmm. years, um, how have you navigated social media such that it's a safe place for them? Because you can't avoid it. And I know parents who have banned it, but, you know, their kids are like, but everybody's on it. Like, yeah. how do you even navigate that? Because my daughter's not quite at social media age, but it's coming. Well, that's very interesting. And when you say you can't ban that because kids are going to talk about it the next day, and that is so true. Go back to when we were at school. If we didn't watch the cool shows on television the next day in the playground, if the conversation was about whatever show it was and you didn't see it, you weren't part of that conversation. So effectively you were ostracised. So social media has its part. There's a lot of negatives. There are some positives. But only just this week, I've convinced my daughter to go onto Twitter and follow some news feeds ah. as against just Insta and uh, Pinterest and, and what have you. So we sort of did lay down the rules, and I'm sure they've been broken, but we did lay down the rules a couple of years back, and we gave allocated times that they could be uh, on their phones, and their phone charges are actually... Uh, uh, downstairs, so their bedrooms are upstairs, their chargers are downstairs, which means their phones have to charge at night downstairs away from their bedrooms. Mm. So that was the case uh, up until nine o'clock, they could be on their mobile devices. Um, my son plays some games with, with his mates and I know he sneaks down and gets the phone now and takes it back upstairs. But um, I think you, well, you try, well, it's a conversation, you try and be as open as you, you can to your child. And um, you think your child tells you everything, they're not going to tell you everything. But if you can have a, an open dialogue um, and you don't keep saying back in my day or if it was me, you just let them be their own person and try and navigate them through the rights and wrongs and let them make the odd mistake, knowing fully well that you can actually rectify uh, if it gets too bad. Hey, just, just while I think of it, if anybody has any questions for Joe or for myself, please um, just, just go on the chat and ask us a question. And, uh, and we'll try and answer it. And being a weather presenter or being a weatherman, I can lie and get away with it. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, Joe, I want to talk about your career, if I may, because okay. you've been in radio, you've been in television, and also newspaper, magazines, you're writing stories, you're writing books. How does that all come about? And tell me a bit about the best parts and then the bad parts. Mm. Well, I started in radio because I've been doing stand-up comedy. And okay. yes. Uh, I was discovered, like literally discovered, like they say in the movies, yeah. in a dingy pub in Collingwood, the Prince Pat Hotel in uh, Victoria Parade in Collingwood. Um, I was doing a, a stand-up comedy at that time with a comedy partner, Jody J. Hill, and they came and saw our show. Um, and they asked us if we wanted to do a radio show, like a Sunday night development radio show. But I think the reason that we caught their attention was because in that show was, <laughs> I can't even believe this, we did this now, but we, we okay, so the, so the theory of it is yeah. um, we, wanted, we wanted to prove that women could be funny naked, right? Oh. Okay. Because, because it was like 2000, 2001 or something, and um, Billy Connolly had just run naked through Piccadilly Circus, right? And, and it was for Red Nose Day he was doing that. And um, it was hilarious, you know, he was all sort of jingly bits and all kind of bold but really awkward at the same time. He had a little wobbly bottom and it was just like hilarious, right? And everybody thought that was so funny and we thought it was funny too. But we kind of looked at 
the history of women being naked, they're always either really got to be really sexy and alluring and perfect, or they're hairy or fat or freakish, but never funny, right? Mm -hmm. So we decided we would prove that you could be funny naked. So we went down to Jodie's house in Point Lonsdale, her parents' house, and they had a vacant block next door. And so my husband filmed us running naked through the vacant block in Point Lonsdale. Was he your husband then? Yes, he was, yes. Okay. Um, Jody was very trusting to let him do that, <laughs> I must say. And um, so we edited it and, uh, you know, it was pretty, I've got to say it was hilarious because, like, we replayed the bit where Jody flung off her undies and they hit her in the face and we slowed down all the bits where your boobs are kind of going like that, right? And we really kind of really milked that. And we sort of, and you know, the interesting thing is, I don't know if this is making you all uncomfortable, Mark, but when you run naked, your boobs don't kind of um, go, so they sort of go, they don't work in unison. They're kind of separate to each other. That's very very unfair. Anyway, um, so I think that's what caught their attention. Was okay. that, well, that was a good story. So it could have been uh, a radio show or volleyball. Yeah. <laughs> us this Sunday night development show on Fox FM which we really I mean just out of nowhere that doesn't really happen anymore no. um and because and then from there we ended up doing mornings Jody and I for two years and we were the first two women to have a commercial radio show together as co-hosts um yeah. which we, you know amazing we loved it we had the best time ever now, can I ask, you've gone through a couple of co-hosts uh, since then. Who makes that decision? And is it easy or hard when someone says, okay, we're going to put you with him? Because you said you and Jody were buddies and you did it together. So when they chop and change, what's that like? Um, well, most of the time you're just happy that you have a job. Yeah. <laughs> and you do generally have a say like I could easily have said, oh, I, I'm not going to work with that person. Okay. Um, it would mean perhaps I might not have got the gig. I don't know. But I really have been blessed. I've worked with incredible people. Mm -hmm. I've worked. I love Matt Tilly. And that was the greatest 10 years of my life working on the Matt and Joe show. Limo is incredible. So generous, super funny, really kind. Um, now I work with Das on the House of Wellness again. And I think that's one of the things that has kept me really enjoying working with them is that our values, all three of those guys, our values are the same in that where we value being kind, we value generosity, and that makes them generous performers as well. I yeah. think you would understand, Mike, that sometimes when you're kind of working off someone, you've got people who are generous with the keeping of the ball in the air Yes. And then there were people who go, well, I don't really want to share the ball. Correct. The ball's mine. <laughs> and that can yeah. be hard. Well, funny you should add that into it because uh, I was co-hosting a breakfast radio show in Canberra for a couple of years. And then uh, on a Sunday night, the boss rang um, myself and the co-host at home and said, hey, good news. What's that? He said, you get to sleep in from tomorrow. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we were told that we were no longer required on that occasion. Now, your radio career... Um, subsided or was put aside, if you like, a couple of years ago, um, and no fault of your own because you're raining through the roof and uh, you got the phone call. Um, how did you take that? How, how did you survive that? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting, Mike, that you and I have had the same experience in that we've both been retrenched, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing because at the moment, lots of people are being retrenched. Yeah uh and so it's it's a common experience but until you've been through it it's really hard to understand how how much it can really shake you um i found it very hurtful mm. but i uh and i was hurt for a long time um but i think the problem was that i just had never thought of myself as anything but that job and um so in the end, it was actually a blessing because I spent a lot of time understanding who I actually am mm -hmm. and not defining myself by what I do, but who I am and what I believe in and my purpose and why I do what I do. And that was very profound and really transformative for me. And I, in the end, I'm kind of, I'm, I feel really blessed that I had that experience. Well, I think also you had some experience writing books as well. That sort of assisted you. And I've got to say, funny enough, if you like, uh, when I thought times are going to be tough in the world of television a few years back, I thought to myself, what else would I like to do? And a friend of mine was a 
or still is a marriage celebrant, Greg Evans from Perfect Match Days. And so I thought, you know what, I might do that. So I become a wedding celebrant. So it's one of those industries that you get into and then it's word of mouth from venues, from other couples getting married. It takes a little while, but after three or four years, you start getting plenty of work. And last year, I was really at the swing of things. And uh, unfortunately, the television career finished, but uh, because of COVID, there's no wedding. So my backup plan hasn't sort Yay! of worked out. <laughs> so, I mean, what's your experience been of, of being retrenched? How have you found working through the many emotions that you feel? Well, you do. You go through all the ups and downs. And uh, it's funny, some people contact you, some don't. Uh, some people contact you all the time and you have friends who are meaning it well, but they want to ask how you are and can they do anything for you? And, think, oh. and uh, others might say, um, so that's it. So what are you going to do next? Like, well, I don't think I've finished in television yet. Oh, well, um, no. Uh, what else would you want to do? I think, oh, gee, I haven't really thought about it. And that's the thing, which, uh, as you were mentioning a moment ago, suddenly when you are retrenched from any industry, I guess, and when it's a, a shrieking industry, you really think about what else am I going to do? Now, for myself personally, I think uh, weddings will pick up uh, at the end of the year, next year, and I'll be back in the swing of things and may get a couple of other uh, jobs here and there. I'm doing a corporate video next week for an environment company, surprisingly enough. Uh, but but. A lot of people have been retrenched, a lot of people losing their, their jobs and uh, you do, you go through all the emotions and uh, it's not a good feeling because you start questioning your ability and mm -hmm. you start questioning what you can do and what else you can do. So it's sort of a rebirth uh, for a lot of people. The other thing was also I found that when I was retrenched, I continued working for another month. Uh, and uh, then I had a month before I could uh, work anywhere else, which is this week. Uh, but that extra month that I worked, once I knew that I was no longer going to be there, uh, which came as a, as a shock, I came home to my children who had been homeschooling all day. So I had to come home as the, as the tough dad, the, you know, no problems at all, because they had their concerns. Mm. And that I found quite, quite challenging as well. My wife uh, works in travel. So, of course, that's another industry that's gone mm. you know, uh, under and um, so she was working at home the two kids schooling at home and then I come home trying to be all fresh and happy and smiley knowing that I didn't quite know what I was doing in the future so it certainly was challenging now I just want to go back to yourself you mentioned about the house of well-being you mentioned Das as the third sort of male person that you've teamed up with we're talking about Luke Darcy yes Luke Darcy now, now yeah. Luke Darcy ex-football player does radio does television and he he is very very good uh, a great guy to work with and also he has a wonderful business acumen with the pubs that he owns and runs with his mum and things like that so when you work with a person like Luke Darcy or somebody who's professional as well how does the chemistry work does it just start like that or do you have to get to know each other when you're working with somebody like that yeah it's it takes time absolutely it's why a lot of most breakfast radio shows get given you know, at least a year, sometimes two years to kind of bed in and to really um, connect and make that chemistry work. Um, and because it's, you know, it's kind of like going to a dinner party every day when you first start working together. It's kind of like, um, you, you know, you sort of get to know each other in, in like onion rings, don't you? And you don't, you don't make yourself vulnerable right from the start because then... You can sort of freak people out if you're, too, <laughs> if you're too honest. So you got to sort of feel each other out and understand how you work. And it does take time. But I think, um, like, again, like Das is a very, um, he's a really open guy. In As long as, you know, you just sort of, you know, the thing is, I reckon, Mike, for all of the times in your life when you're working with other people, it doesn't matter whether it's me on a TV show or, you when you get your next job or anybody it's about curiosity it's mm -hmm. about really being willing to ask the next question and listen to what they're saying and sort of just I don't know make an assessment about someone's values and an assessment about oh that's that's what they're really interested in and locking that away and using that for future conversations and knowing that that can be a fun area to play. Mm -hmm. um, that's my job when I'm, I'm trying to get a rapport with someone is understanding them to the point where I know if I serve them a, a ball figuratively, mm -hmm. that's going to be something they want to play with. Um, and I think anytime you're connecting with someone, curiosity is the key. Now you're talking about openness. How open are you? <laughs> 
Uh, I'll tell you why I asked that as well is because... Uh, the, well, I just told you about running naked, so <laughs> maybe two open. But that was in the that was in the early days. Um, <laughs> but uh, actually, do, do, do you do stand-up comedy anymore? Or no. Is that, no, okay. no. Now, when I read your articles in the magazines, is it be once a month, would it be? Uh, about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I find you very open there. And uh, I... I, I I appreciate and often it's about Willow and life at home and, and with hubby and uh, some things like that. And the way you write, it, it, it's exceptional. It's, it's the way you communicate with your voice, but also in your writing. And I can picture that. Oh, now, how long lovely. does it take you to write that page of, um, you know, because it's like a, it's almost like a slice of life and it may be a day in the life of, but I'm just wondering, do you sit down on a Sunday night and think, okay, I've got to work that out or you're just doing bits and pieces and put it together? How does that work? Um, so this is my column in the Sunday Life magazine, which I've been doing now for eight years. I can't even wow, remember. eight years. Too. I know. I'm, well, that 25 years at 10, I'm sure, just flew by for you, Mike. It's, you know, <laughs> life just... <I'm> life. <laughs> um, but so because it's been eight years, I will say the hardest part is coming up with an idea that I haven't already written about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I'm writing it, because a lot of it is, I guess, um, about just the human condition and what I'm sort of managing at that time, I think to myself, God, the readers must think that I'm a basket case. Because every, every well, fair enough, everything <laughs> I write about seems to be about some kind of mental turmoil, or some challenge I've had or whatever. So I don't know about that, but some of them take a long time to write. So like, you know, they're only 800 words, but some of them take a couple of days and others are much quicker and they'll be I'll bash them out in sort of half a day but um I really I I love doing it but I I um and you know it's a bit weird because I'll write it and now I'll be really happy with it send it off and then when I see it in print I go wow I really shared a lot about my life <laughs> with that. I, I reckon you do but you're not sort of aware of it right. it's kind of and like even on radio, you're sort of in that moment telling yes. the story for a purpose and the end mean the end goal is to either entertain or move your audience or make them think or whatever. Yeah. And that's what you're focusing on. And then afterwards you're like, holy, wow, I really... <laughs> <laughs> so what makes a good storyteller? Oh, well, you love stories. What, what do you think makes a good storyteller? Um... A bit of humour, a bit of truth, something that people relate to, someone who can go, wow, that is so me. I could do that or I've done that or, uh, yeah, I, I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also, I think the general public can see through a fake person. Yes, that's true. But I'm not sure when, if, if I'm not sure you're aware whether or not you seem genuine. Okay. Do you, I don't know, do you think you're aware? Um, I don't know if, you, if you're speaking from the heart. Um, I think True. I think you okay. Now we've just had a question here from uh, from Lisa, and she just wants to talk about the fact that we were both retrenched. Did it feel like you're on holidays? How long does it take to reset? And um, are, are there any other things to think about? I don't feel personally I'm on holidays. It doesn't feel like that, especially in COVID. I mean, I go for a run or a, a bike ride each day take the dog down to the park, it's to get out of the house, amongst other things, do a bit of exercise and be ready for the next thing. But it doesn't feel like a holiday. And the other thing is also when you're retrenched, you don't want to spend money. Yes, yeah. So you don't want to book a holiday or you don't want to, because you're not quite sure what's coming up next. So it doesn't yeah. feel like a holiday. I don't think so. Did you? Or no, did you? it doesn't feel like a holiday because you feel you have this nagging sense in the back of your mind the whole time, I should be doing something, I should be doing something, right. and you've got nothing to do. And you've got to find the job and find the job and find the job. But often you can't make jobs materialise. So sometimes it's a waiting game and that's really hard. And I will say with COVID and this year, it's been a very familiar feeling to me, this uncertainty that people talk about. And I feel like I've had a dress rehearsal for it. When mm -hmm. in that year, after I finished in radio, and I was working on the House of Wellness and I felt very blessed, but at the same time, I had that sense of, I don't know what my future is, which is what everybody globally is struggling with. But I feel like I learned how to manage that. And what I did, well, I, I, I meditated every day and I really embraced mindfulness. And that made it so much more manageable for me to know, okay, there isn't any deliberate and necessarily 
um, definite path for me right now. Mm. And that I found, I found the limitlessness of that really like almost like claustrophobia. Like I was so overwhelmed by how much space there was in front of me. Um, but what I did to manage that was to only focus on this day. Oh. This is all I had. This day, this moment, this breath. And that's all. Then it didn't matter what happened the next day or didn't matter how much was in the future or how much uncertainty. And I've used that a lot this year again with COVID. And I wish I could kind of gift that to people when, when they're really struggling with that fear and anxiety that comes with not knowing your future. I wish I could just gift them the year that I learned you can't make it happen because it takes experience to learn it, but it's it's a real, for me, it just calms me so much to know. But all you have is this moment because life then sorts it out. Time sorts it out. Time unfolds and eventually the next thing will come along and you will be fine. It's yeah. just the waiting for it is really hard. I think you are right. And you touched on something earlier. It's about conversations. So having a chat to different people in different uh, backgrounds and you possibly will find something else that's uh, well, appealing. But uh, I've been talking to kids at school for about 25 years, motivational talks um, and all sorts of things. And I've always talked about careers. Don't just get a job, move into a position where you actually enjoy the subject or what have you. So if you like playing footy, you may not become a professional football player, but you could become uh, a sports doctor, medicine, what, what have you, or if you love holidays, you may be moving to travel. Mm -hmm. So I've always talked about not just getting a job. So now I'm thinking that maybe that's not quite right, which is ironic after all these years. I sort of always, I've always gone in the morning and enjoyed what I wanted to do. So now I'm going through the process of, well, I'm not doing anything. So I'm not actually enjoying it. And I so also, I enjoy being a part of someone's day. Yeah. And, uh, I, I miss that part of it as well. I'm not sure if, if you yeah. Would, uh, I, I totally relate. I missed of all the things when I, and I still do radio Sunday mornings for the House of Wellness, uh, which I love because it gives me what I missed most about breakfast radio, which was a conversation with the audience. Yes. Um, and that's what you talk about when you say being a part of someone's life. Breakfast radio is the greatest gift because over time, and it takes time to build up a trust with your audience, but over time, they, they begin to trust you with their stories and their life and the things that matter to them. And they share so much of themselves to you. You share with them all of parts of you. And it's, it's this beautiful relationship of trust and, and honesty. And honestly, the, the stories that we would hear, so funny and so surprising and so honest and raw and moving and, you know, brilliant brilliant parts of people's lives and i yeah i really miss that it's also a skill you bring out a great story from a person now when you tell stories about your family or your daughter did you ever test them or say listen just so you know i'm going to talk about blah 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 or was there a situation where you got home and you go, oh my god i hope they weren't listening um <laughs> i did on occasion learn the hard way that i may have overstepped the mark yes oh, okay. and if I had my time again, I think I would have been a little more protective, I guess. The thing is, I, yeah, I mean, you know what, the content that you churn through on breakfast radio, just that is so challenging to come up with three hours of material every day, five days a week when you probably only had four or five hours sleep and, mm. you know, um, and I, so sometimes you make a bad decision and, um, I, there have been a couple of times when I felt regretful and quite bad about that. And, you know, we all make bad decisions, but when you're in radio, you do it very publicly. I think you're right. Uh, there's, there's no question about that. But of course, you are thinking on your feet and you yes. to keep talking. So there's a challenge there. Well, and, I mean, uh, Mike, you're doing live weather and you've got all <laughs> manner of things going on around you. Surely there have been times when you had to crowd control or something really random has happened. Well, well, yeah, I mean, there has been because uh, I, I was one of the few or one of the few that doesn't use auto cue, so I memorise all my stuff. So what that means is if I'm being irritated by somebody or there's somebody in the peripheral, I know they're going to run across. I'm still trying to remember what I'm about to talk about because there's no auto cue to read it. So 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, hopefully I didn't say too many wrong things. Uh, and basically it was the weather, so it was reasonably narrow. But I do remember when I was doing radio as well, I would tell a story and then months and months later, somebody would bring it up and it's like, oh gosh, and almost someone tell my wife or whatever. And it was not a rude or embarrassing story, but it's something that I possibly shouldn't have shared. Um, now, you did share a lot of stories on radio about Willow. How was she when she went to school? And the reason I asked that, if kids brought it up, because um, Nova, for example, every Wednesday they have a, um, a, a joke Wednesday. Uh, make, Sam, make Sam, that's in Sam Pang, one of the announcers. Oh, yeah. Make yeah. Sam laugh, I think it is. Yep. And they often play a couple of my jokes to get the ball rolling. And they're oh, not okay. funny jokes. I think they're funny, but of course nobody else does, which is fine. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my kids get stirred at school. They go, oh, my God, we heard you down on the radio because I don't watch the news. I heard you down on the radio with those jokes. Are they funny? And my kids, oh, I don't know. But how was Willow when she went to school? Was she, was very, she was very little when I finished yeah, on the Matt and Joe show. And um, even with Limo, yeah, I, I've been really blessed that she still thinks I'm awesome. <laughs> hey, that changes just quietly. I know. <laughs> I reckon I got maybe about a year left, but she totally thinks I'm a rock star. And um, I don't know. I think um, I don't think she fully is aware of what I do. If she knew, if she knew more about the house of wellness and what really it's not pitched at her level, let's face yeah. that. Um, maybe she wouldn't think so. I don't know. Um, I'm, I, the, I will say though, the older she gets, the more aware I am about yeah. what kids might be thinking about her. Yeah. Oh, no, fair, fair enough too. Yeah. Now we talked about uh, in the early mornings and I've got to say, you may or may not agree, but when I was doing breakfast radio, I would feel seedy the whole time. I was always a bit tired and not hung over, but a bit seedy or as if I've um, I've just arrived from bloody London or something like yeah, that. Yeah, jet lag, you're always jet lag. Yeah, yeah, jet lag. But we touched on uh, people, the listeners in Melbourne, et cetera, that just open their hearts and tell stories and you go, know, wow. But you also get to talk to a lot of celebrities. Mm. Are there celebrities that you wanted to talk to but you didn't get a chance to have a chat with? Um, look, the strange thing about when you get to interview celebrities all the time, they really stop impressing you. Okay. <laughs> you kind of, I mean, you sort of, um, obviously they're just people, right? Yeah. And they're just selling the thing that they're trying to make you buy. So they're just selling their movie or selling their TV show mm. or their music. And uh, my job was to try and push that aside because that's all they want to talk about. And mm -hmm. all we wanted to talk about was everything but that. So we could then, <laughs> to get a bit of information about a snippet of who they were. Yes. So there was always a bit of a tussle there. And um, the ones that you liked talking to were the ones that were more open and allowed you to sort of delve into behind the curtains a bit. And the ones that were really protective were just a bit annoying. And yeah. you're like, oh, it's too hard. Why are you even here? Um, and I wouldn't say that I ever, I mean, some celebrities I was, I were, you know, was very excited to meet, yeah. Sarah Jessica Parker and people like that. Recent. But mostly I, um, I just always felt sorry for them a oh, lot okay. of the time. They seemed really, I mean, look, they were probably jet lagged themselves. Um, <laughs> but they always just seemed really. Um, they were doing the rounds. Yeah, like they weren't loving life. And a lot of them felt sad or lonely, maybe. I don't yeah. know. But it's interesting to say that because a lot of celebrities, especially um, actors making movies over in Hollywood, part of the deal is to do to do the round. You've got to promote the movie and they'll give you the itinerary. It might be, okay, you're going down under, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Southeast Asia over a two-week period, and you've got 27 interviews. And they they want to be actors. They don't want to be interviewers or be well, interviewees. Yeah, you're right. I will say you'd be pretty, you'd have to be living under a rock not to know that that's part of the deal if you want to be a big star, right? So I kind of don't have a lot of patience for that. I get that they just want to be actors. but And also you, every now and then you come across people like, like recently I got to spend a couple, well, two days really with Sarah Jessica Parker because she was here for Chemist Warehouse. And um, so we did two kind of big features with her. And the first day she came in and I knew that her schedule was very tight. And I said, you know, how are you going? You must be so tired. And she was like, well, yeah, but it's, what am I doing? It's not a hard job. And I, I agree with her. You're not digging ditches. You're not on the front line anywhere. You're not a, you're not a, an emergency worker. Like 
it's actually a pretty good job. To, and yes, you're tired, but I think, you know, her gratitude around the fact that it's an amazing opportunity for her and, you know, I, I really respect that. There are, there are stars that understand they're lucky and there are stars that kind of lose sight of that, I guess. I think you're right because um, doing some interviews or travelling to do interviews, I mean, if that's the worst it is, it ain't that bad because they're making a lot of money. But has there been anybody you've actually spoken to over the years, maybe once, maybe more than once, you were looking forward to and were disappointed in or interviewed some celebrities, celebrities who thought, oh, my God, that was terrible. Um, I'm always told that Tommy Lee Jones, the actor, is one of the worst people to interview because he gives you nothing, for example. Um, I've never interviewed Tommy Lee Jones, so I wouldn't know about that. But um, let me see. There were times when you'd interview people and you'd think, I'm not sure you were in the room with me, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like they were so removed that you were like, so Zac Efron was like that. I was just like, I'm not even sure you know where you are, but I no, don't think you're with me. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, and there were some that, yeah, they would give you nothing. I'll tell you, Harrison Ford, he, he is so um, disinterested in giving you an answer that, so usually interviews go over time and, you know, they do a junket. So you'd go to Crown and all of the different breakfast shows were all there waiting for their eight minutes. You had eight minutes, no more, um, in the room. And then just wheel you through like a conveyor belt. Yep. And the star would wait there. And you'd always have to wait for ages for your turn because they'd always go overtime, right? Yep. Well, we were, um, you know, knew that we had Harrison Ford at, say, 10.30. So we were going to leave to go to Crown at 10 past 10. We got a phone call at 9.45 from the publicist saying, could you come now? We're running wow. early. And we're like, Ooh, wow. what happened? Because, and that was because Harrison Ford had nothing to say. Like <laughs> literally two word answers to everything. And so people were just going, wrap it up. We're out of here. It's a nightmare. So what's better, interviewing or chatting with the public or celebrities? Oh, the public every time. Okay, I would totally choose the public every time, it, unless it's Sarah Jessica Parker, because I thought we were going to be best friends. It hasn't <laughs> happened yet. But I convinced myself that she would want to hook up with me via Twitter and then we'd become great mates and yeah. we'd end up, you know, joining, to meeting up in New York. And look, it hasn't happened yet, Mike, but well, you, know, I, you like, never know. Let me tell you, um, when I was young, when I, when I was a teenager, I had a crush, if you like, not on Sarah Jessica Parker because she wasn't around there, but I had a crush on Brooke Shields. Ah, good choice. So I did everything in my power to meet her, and I did, and I worked on a movie with her for six weeks in Israel. Get out of town! So how's that for a story? But that's that's another that's story. amazing. No, you must tell me more. What was the movie? It was a movie called Sahara, and yeah. it was about a car race across the Sahara Desert, and it was filmed in the Negev Desert in the middle of Israel. And just taking it back a step or two, when I was young, I used to work on short-term and long-term goals. And when I was 14, I worked out what I wanted to do in life. Obviously, that's changed you know, as of last week, but um, I worked out what I wanted to do. And one of the short-term goals, if you like, was if I hadn't succeeded in radio or television, and by that stage, I was working in both, but if I hadn't succeeded by the time I was 21 properly, in my mind, I was going to circumnavigate the globe. So just before I turned 22, I packed up and spent two years backpacking around Europe, America, uh, North Africa. But of course I had to work. So there were three jobs that I wanted to do. I wanted to work at a pub in London, which I did. I wanted to go to France and pick grapes. I got there at the wrong time of the year. So I continued to Greece and picked olives, same, same. And the other thing I wanted to do was to work on a Hollywood movie. And uh, the next step, it was towards Christmas was Israel. And I went to, uh, Israel for, uh, I was there for about three or four months and I was working on a kibbutz, which was like a communal farm, yeah. milking cows, making pizzas, etc. And uh, I wanted to go there towards the end of the year because not that I'm religious, but I wanted to have Christmas in Bethlehem, which I did. Beautiful, right? But whilst I was in Israel, the Jerusalem Post, which is the only newspaper in English, front page, Hollywood coming to Israel, including so, 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 and Brooke Shields. So that's it. So, I, uh, yes, I, I caught a bus up to, uh, to Tel Aviv and uh, long story, but I sort of convinced them that I was an actor from Australia, which obviously I really wasn't, although I was, I, I'd done some very small acting, so I had an actor's equity card, so it sort of yeah. indicated I was an actor. I, also, I had long hair and a beard as I was backpacking around uh, Europe and what have you, and the male lead in this movie, Sahara, had long hair and a beard, 
And a couple of weeks later, they were looking for a stand-in for him. And they said, if you go down to Elat, which is near the Israel-Egypt border, uh, we might be able to get you some work on the movie. So, of course, I, I did. So I went down there and then worked on the movie for six weeks with, with Brooke Shields. So, uh, How amazing. That yeah. is amazing. <laughs> so here's, here's, I love what you, you mentioned there around setting long-term and short-term goals. Did you actually, as a teenager, did you actually write yeah. proper goals down? Yep. That's pretty so, amazing. So I think also because I grew up in the western suburbs, we had no money and I wanted to escape that environment and do something with my life, let's say. And yep. my family were very poor. My sister and I shared a bedroom until I was 12 sort of thing. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I learned how to play the guitar, not very well, but by the time I was 14, I was playing guitar in a band and uh, they said when I was 16, hey, he plays like a 14-year-old. So I didn't yeah. actually improve. Um, and then, yeah, so, so there's things like that. Then I wanted, wanted to become a singer when I was 15, so I became a singer. 16, I wanted to uh, uh, work in a newspaper, so I did. So it was, it, back then it was year by year. So right. 16 was a newspaper, uh, 17 was um, television. Uh, there was a couple of TV shows. There was The Young Doctors, The Restless Years, and I was an extra in those shows, a couple of, couple of other things. Then 18, become a radio announcer in a country town in northern New South Wales. So that, that was the sort of short term. And there were other little things. So when I was 18, in my mind, success was all about making lots of money. Mm. And the big show at the time was Sale of the Century. Yes. And the car of the century was the Mercedes. So at 18, I said I'd give myself 10 years to own a Mercedes. So that was a longer term goal. And then I'd be successful. So when I was 28, I bought a Mercedes. It was a secondhand Mercedes Lemon, but I bought that Mercedes. <laughs> interesting because like you I speak at schools and um I like to talk about purpose um but see I because I I think goal setting is an amazing thing to do yeah. but I didn't know there's no one set no one role modeled that for me when I was growing up and like you I, we were in a very we were a, you know very poor family as well and um it didn't occur to me to sort of set goals like that so I always say to kids what I did, though, is I knew what I loved, which was writing, and I just never stopped. I just always looked for opportunities to write, and I didn't know how I would use that as a skill or a love, but I kind of felt like I always would. Mm -hmm. And in the end, everything I've done is related to writing. And so if I was to actually put my occupation, even though I might be in radio or I might be on TV or what, podcasting, whatever it is, actually what I am is a writer. And I often say to kids, well, if you, you might not necessarily want to set a goal or you might not necessarily have a dream, but at the very least know what you love and do it a lot. Do it as much as you possibly can. I agree. Remember once somebody, I can't think who it was, but someone once said to kids, said, if you didn't have to work, what would you like to do? Mm. And do that. Mm. How, how cool is that? So, yeah, uh, just very quickly, the kibbutz I was in, I think somebody was asking, might have been Kathy, uh, it was a kibbutz called Bet Govrin, which was a small kibbutz near Beersheba. Uh, and it was also where uh, supposedly Jesus hid all those years ago. And uh, at that same time, I did spend New Year's at Jerusalem. So uh, Amazing. And what was Christmas like in Bethlehem? Uh, wasn't what you thought. Uh, it's an Arab town and uh, <laughs> you, you were searched from, you know, like top to bottom and getting through. But the main area there was actually called Manger Square. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was all little tacky souvenir shops and you buy a little bit of wood, which of course was from the cross. But uh -huh. uh, just while we're sort of diverting a little bit, what was interesting was, uh, which I found very, very interesting, was a path in um, Jerusalem called Via Della Rosa. Yes, and that was yeah. the path that Jesus supposedly took carrying the cross. Mm -hmm. And as you walk up the path, which is cobblestone, there's little chapters. And that was supposedly where he fell. And the most famous uh, lead light, if you like, was an imprint of uh, Jesus' face on a cloth. And that was uh, mm -hmm. last there. So when you get to the top, there's the uh, Church of Holy Sepulchre. And uh, there's a gold plate under Jesus on the cross. And the gold plate has a cylinder missing in the, in the center. And if you put your hand down the cylinder, you can actually touch the earth. And that supposedly is exactly where the cross was at Calvary. So wow. uh, all those sort of cool stories back then. So uh, yeah. I would love to see that. Mm, yeah. Yes. So uh, and, and look, that, that's the thing. Uh, you, you can do whatever you want to do as long as you turn your dreams into goals. And when someone says no, you go and ask somebody else. And I think that's one of the lessons that we have to sort of uh, assist kids with uh, because it's easy to be average and you don't need to be. 
and you can't expect someone to give you something all the time. You have to go out and get it. And also you'll enjoy it better. And when I do talk to kids, I always ask kids if they think success is about making lots of money and they'll put their hand up and say, no, no, success is about being happy on a daily basis. And yeah. they'll sort of elaborate. But I just want to go back to you talking about mindfulness. What, what actually is that? And the House of Wellbeing, it's just a good feel show on radio and television as well. Yes. So mindfulness is quite literally the act of noticing. That's mm -hmm. as simple as you can make it. Um, it's used as a way of managing the thoughts that we all have. Um, it's about catching your thought, noticing that you've had it, and without judgment. It's really key to mindfulness. There's no judgment. It's all the space of compassion for self. Just noticing, oh, I had that thought. Is that a true thought? Not necessarily. Let that go and return to present moment. So present moment awareness as far as like living in this moment, this breath um, really changed my life because I realised that um, all the things in the past that, have made, that were making me sad, they don't exist anymore, right? And all the things in the future that I'm scared of that make me anxious, they haven't happened yet. All that's happening right now is this moment and even if I'm really sad and even if I'm managing feelings that are real, you've got to let your feelings feel. You've got to feel the feels, Mike. Um, that's, that's normal and human. But even while you're doing that, right here, right now, there's nothing to fear or nothing to be sad about because right here, right now, this is it. This is perfect. This is good. I've got everything I need and I am everything I need. So, so is the unknown scary though? Adam. Is the unknown? Sorry, my wife is walking past. <laughs> She's sneaking to get a drink on the floor. I'm going to show you. I didn't want to show you this before, but I've got a bar over there, and my wife is sneaking just down there to get a drink. Not that she's an alcoholic. Mike, that is the greatest moment I've ever seen. <laughs> I just saw her little feet going past. <laughs> And they are a little thing. Should be <laughs> happy to say that. Now, Joe, I want to uh, wrap it up if I if okay. I can. Yeah. Now, if there was any message that you'd like to send, uh, uh, I guess young people, uh, we'll start with that. Um, and of course, you've got Willow. Uh, what, what, what's ahead? What, what would be an encouraging sort of uh, message? That Hello. You... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's so embarrassing, right, Joe? Here, here I am trying to show you. I've got a glass of water and nothing else. Um, yeah, so what would be a message you'd like to perhaps leave with young people? Um, that there is a part of you that is truly you. And the only way to know that part of you is to give yourself a time every day where you are still and you are silent. You don't need to necessarily meditate. I love meditating, but not everybody does. I mean, this is not just for young people. This is for everybody. Because I reckon the older you get, you kind of disconnect with that part of you sometimes. It's even harder to remember. But if you give yourself just 5, 10, 15 minutes every day to be still and silent and breathe and just let that part of you really speak to you, that is, that is your, that's your compass. That's your navigator for life and for that day and for that moment. And it's your navigator to know how do I feel about this? How do I know what my values are? How can I react to what is going on in my life? How do I make decisions? How do I choose the people to have relationships with? That part of you is so important and no one can touch it and it's very precious. And it's the part that's perfect and love that part because it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, um, perfect version of you and it's totally unique wow you've made me relax thank you very much there joe joe stanley star of radio television newspaper magazine stand-up comedy with the wobbly bits yeah <laughs> <laughs> we really really appreciate your time and, and good luck in the future thanks and, and to uh, you mike good luck oh, for you as well and thank okay. you so much and i know that 25 years in television is a is a massive achievement so i hope you feel proud of that well, you've got to look back at the positive. You can't look at the negatives. And I'm going to leave everyone with this thought. Always be kind to all of your friends because if it weren't for them, you'd be a total stranger. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Mike. Oh, wow. What a great chat. I'm so pleased that both of you were able to join us tonight. 
um, I, I felt a little bit like uh, the conversation was a little bit like Melbourne's weather. Uh, I'm getting onto your track there, Mike. Yeah. You know, you, you took us through some beautiful sunny stories, some really rainy stories and back into, into gorgeous sunsets and, and bright days again. And what I got out of it most was the, the authenticity and generosity of both of you sharing your lives with us. The, the uh, openness, you're both exceptional communicators and you're talking about the human condition. And I think we were very, very privileged to be able to, to enjoy and share that. Joe, you, your overriding message, I think, was focus on today. You wish that you could give that to us. And I think you have. And it reminds me that, um, you know, yesterday is history. Mm. Tomorrow's a mystery. So today is the present. Yep. Enjoy it. It's a gift. Uh, Mike, success is being happy on a daily basis. Thank you for that reminder. Too many people think it's anything but that. And I think that's, that's really important. I'm going to finish with Willow. <laughs> Willow thinks you're awesome. You know what? She's right. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being with us both. Now, at the start, when I got a little bit all kerfluffled with uh, technology and everything, I had said that there were two things I wanted to do, and I shared the CSA with, with you all, which I'm really, really proud of. Our volunteers did an awesome job in bringing that together. But you can see behind me there, we, a friend of ours, Andy Herman, has created this quilt uh, in honour of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she's called it Rise in Power. Uh, in my background. Can you see it there, Joe? Yeah. And we're it's beautiful. It's gorgeous, isn't it? And we've got that up as an online auction at the moment with all funds, 100% of the funds going to go to the child, court child care pro thing. So please share it with your, your friends. I'd love to see it in a court or in a barrister's uh, chambers or in a judge's chambers or a lawyer's chambers or in a school. So please share this with, with all your friends. Uh, we're going to keep the auction alive until our AGM, which is in uh, late November. Again, Mike, Joe, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our next impact chat is in two weeks' time, and we'll be having the former Premier of Victoria, Ted Bailey, in conversation with an impact board member who is a former Labor MP, Philip Daladakis. Um, it's going to be a in really interesting banter and we hope you'll all be here to join us. It'll be same time, same place on the 28th of October. Until then, everybody, stay home, stay safe and see you soon. Thank you.